So, normally, I do these wider spanning lore or story analysis videos, covering a whole subject all at once. But today, I thought I'd go different. What if we do the exact opposite? So today, we are covering one part of a story, and really figuring out why it works, at least for me. And once I found it, I knew I wanted to talk about this part. The one singular part of Hildebrand that genuinely made me laugh. Two quick disclaimers. First, spoiler warning for Endwalker Hildebrand. It's best to be up to date elsewhere, but that's all you need. Second, an opinion warning, because I have them. And I'm about to say some things about one of the most polarizing stories in the game, so get ready! If you like this, please give a like, subscribe, comment, all that, and get ready. Because I think I have to start with why only one part of Hildebrand has ever made me laugh. I don't think this is a helpful way to start this. I'm not even sure the people that aren't on the same page as me on this even care. But, I'm both a pedant and absolutely adore comedy. So when I say I don't like Hildebrand's comedy, I want to explore that, for me as much as anyone. First of all, let's just talk about the backbone of Hildebrand. Big, dumb, physical comedy. Comedy is a genre of entertainment that is famously really hard to translate across cultures, but physical comedy transcends that completely. There is no element of culture more universally translatable than the comedy of Man Fall Down. It's why Mr. Bean is perhaps the most universally beloved show on Earth. And I'm not about to say I'm immune to this. My love of comedy started with some amazing physical comedians from here in Australia. But if I want to step back and talk about why a lot of this works for me, it's because I'm seeing real people do it. A lot of physical comedy is essentially stunt work, and a lot of the enjoyment comes from seeing real people doing this insane stuff. It's why Jackie Chan was so focused on doing his own stunts and selling it as believable. Because it's so much more engaging when you can see the real human within it. The comedy of Jackass comes in large part from the fact these are real people hitting themselves with all this nonsense. Even in more low-key stuff, this holds. Even if Mr. Bean's not doing some absurd pratfall and is just taking a test or doing laundry, it carries because Rowan Atkinson's reactions are both recognizably human and cartoonish as hell. Turning Mr. Bean into a cartoon didn't distill his comedy to me, it robbed him of an important dimension. Comedy in an animated medium just doesn't have that dimension that works so well for me. That's not to say animated media can't do physical comedy, but it's missing the main tool that works for me. It's got to find some substitutes, and it's got to make them good. And for me, that's an uphill battle. But the stuff that most regularly manages it is like The Simpsons, which backs it up with rock-solid writing to the point where it's not just physical comedy. So, what does Hildebrand back it up with? Well, here's where translation comes in. Man Fall Down translates. And honestly, I think a lot of the rest really doesn't. I've watched and played enough Japanese media to recognize that Hildebrand is packed to the gills with very Japanese jokes. And frankly, most of them just aren't very funny outside that context. Especially with a few cultural movements that have happened over recent years. That Lalafell stalker, I don't know, was ever funny, to be honest. But in a world where we're more culturally aware of sexual harassment, he's really not getting over the line. The multiple jokes about Hildebrand cross-dressing are absolutely not finding a warm audience in me as a trans person, but somehow I'm actually less offended at that than I am at them turning Ultros into a one-note sexual assault gag. Ultros was a multi-layered, multi-joke character in Six. The sexual assault angle was the smallest and the weakest. Ultros doesn't deserve to be attacked like that, and unlike me, he is too fictional to defend himself. I also suspect, and this is something I can't back up because I just don't know enough Japanese, that there's some jokes that don't translate not because they come out the other end offensive, but because they come out the other end as just nothing. You can't make that into a joke that's funny in English, 
so they just don't. None of this is a knock against the localization. I think they do an amazing job. I just think they were faced with the impossible here. Also, this doesn't mean I think Hildebrand is badly written. I like Hildebrand for the world building, which I recognize does sound like watching porn for the set design, but hear me out. Its tone and low to the ground focus makes for the ability to world build in ways that very few other common pieces of content can. It reminds me of something I saw said about Star Trek Lower Decks, the show, not the TNG episode. That show having a comedic angle and focusing on significantly lower stakes conflicts means that it can use parts of the Star Trek universe that none of the other shows are in a position to touch, either because they're tonally out of place or just way too small scale. Hildebrand is the same. Being a comedy detective story puts it in a place where it can explore subjects that nothing else is in the space to explore. And even if I don't think that the jokes it makes about those are very funny, I can appreciate the fresh angle. So what was the angle that finally worked then? Every Hildebrand story, and in turn a lot of Hildebrand's jokes, are heavily built around the setting that they're placed in. Stormblood Hildebrand was all in Kugane, for example, so all of its storytelling and comedy was built around the tropes and characters that make sense in that context, which obviously makes it, as a story, perhaps the most Japanese thing in the game. But we're not talking Stormblood Hildebrand, we're talking Endwalker Hildebrand. And Endwalker Hildebrand is a funny one, because more than any other Hildebrand story, including A Realm Reborn Hildebrand, it bounced around in setting a lot. We go to Thavnir, Labyrinthos, the moon, even some stuff on the first. So it couldn't and didn't use the actual region it takes place in as its context. A Realm Reborn solution was essentially Hildebrand's cast itself, building around them and the central mystery around the mysterious thief. That worked back then, but it wouldn't have worked in Endwalker. We're too used to these idiots. So they take a new angle. And I think the heart of that angle is Delian. Now, Delian's one of those elements that translates poorly, but not in as direct a way as the stuff I talked about earlier. It's very clear what sort of a joke Delian is. He's a comedy conspiracy theorist, spouting the most outlandish theories you've ever heard, and being comically off the mark, even when faced with stuff he got really close to with the added direction that a few of his theories are right on the money, but that he basically just got by chance. He's Dale Gribble from King of the Hill, basically. But the thing about that sort of character, at least in the West, is that they've had a huge change in perception. In the Dale Gribble days, they were harmless whack jobs whose theories were basically perpendicular to any political reality. They might have intersected enough to involve a politician or major issue sometimes, but we're just sort of too far off in their own fantasy world to really matter. But these days, when the conspiracy theorist image is less Dale Gribble and more Alex Jones, it's kinda hard for me to take someone like Delian to be the kind of joke that they're telling. You can tell Alex Jones jokes, but they are a very different energy. I suspect Japan doesn't really have an Infowars or OAN to poison that well, so Delian flies better there, but I'm not entirely sure. But whether this joke lands or not, he's the one that hammers in the actual tone and focus of the storyline. Rather than focus on the terrestrial realities of the setting, we're going higher. We're focusing on the weird shit, a lot of which Endwalker also played in. He also gets us actually thinking about the lore as part of the joke, as he's spouting both absurd nonsense and equally absurd actual truths. The storyline's more mundane investigations into a corrupt Thavnarian merchant and Dr. Lugai are essentially just pretense to get the more mundane-focused Hildebrand and Nashu looking at this crazier shit. And said crazier shit brings us the story's more irregular players, the alien Poopoo and the faulty clone Branderhild. And it's these two that provide more material connections to the story around them. Delian was just a tone setter. It's Poopoo -poo that gets us actually looking towards the stars in terms of subject matter. And Branderhild starts us asking physiological questions, albeit 
in his case, in the context of Godbit style jokes about his abilities, especially in relation to Hildebrand himself. Poo-Poo's got his own story about finding his lost friend, but that's not really that important to us. What's important is a certain little thing his ongoing story uncovers. An artifact from an ancient civilization. Yeah, you know where this is going by now. I feel like there's this clear divide between the community on this joke. The people who recognize how good it is, and the people who can't even tell they're being told one. And I get it because it's doing something that's extremely hard to pull off. Because the core of all of this is the game making an entirely straight-faced, no-winking joke about something the game itself does. On its surface, it's clear what we're looking at. Godbrand Mandeville, ancestor of Hildebrand and Godbert, is telling his family secret. An ancient race of symbiotic aliens, the Mandevillians, were hit by what we recognize as the end of days, their entire society just collapsing under it. Two survivors escaped, making their way to what turned out to be the source. One of them is lost and mysterious, their position and condition unknown. The other found a sickly old Arn man, and fused with him, giving him great strength, durability, and knowledge of that symbiote. So it's kind of like a Superman or Goku thing crossed with, like, the Trill from Star Trek. There's some good comedy in its presentation, and I think that sort of distracts people from the real joke. They see that it's a whole symbolic lore dump told via a one-man puppet show, leaning into both the jokes around his difficulty with that, and impossible movements despite that. And naturally, afterwards you've got the joke of the Mandevilles bawling their eyes out, contrasted with the stone-faced Arcasodra who are not there for any clear reason. Again, I don't like most of the physical comedy, but this one I can recognize as pretty well structured. They're cute little extra comedy bits. That's not the main joke, because here's my read. This isn't any old lore dump. It's a parody of lore dumps. It's making fun of not just the presentation, but the content and response. The actual presentation is unique, but it's not too far unlike some of the more conceptual lore dumps. I think the closest cousin is probably the Aron Reborn one describing the White Aurasite plan, mixed with the conceits of Emmett Selk explaining how the Sundering works using the Crystal Towers imaging. The music is exactly the same music that Endwalker itself likes using for its more info-dumpy scenes. Although granted, that's a bit hard to read for a joke, because, again, exactly how they do that seriously. The actual content, though, this is exactly something 14 does constantly, and something that they've been open about. Tying new stuff into older landmarks to sell the new turn. Ironically, Dynamis and the End of Days actually didn't get this to such an overt degree. This is much more like how the truth of Amarot and its fall forced such a hefty revision of Hydaelyn and Shadowbringers. That this figure that you assumed was just a little bit sus, now has that uncertainty answered, but in a way that completely throws off your expectations and raises just a whole bunch of new questions. There's even the classic moment of either this is a reused asset or we're meant to read something into this, as the symbiote puppet is pretty clearly a coblin, which is a recurring Hildebrand joke. One that crops up I think in the same patch, in fact. It's all a pitch-perfect imitation of the way these lore dumps usually go. Maybe too pitch perfect in fact, because again, a lot of people just take it as a normal lore dump despite it being, you know, in Hildebrand. And then the reactions. Now these I love because not only do you see reflections of how certain types of characters react to this sort of info, but I also think they reflect different ways that players do. First of all, the Mandevilles. High emotion, high buy-in. They immediately accept all of this new reality and everything it means to them. This is how most of the Scions generally take this sort of news. I think most often Alphino hits this note, but Graha's a strong recent bringer of it. Of course, that's also how most of the fan base responds to a lot of this. For the most part, if you give us a big reveal paired with emotionality, we will buy it as a player base. It's a huge part of Emmett Selk's appeal. Then we have Nashu, who's asking questions. She's not skeptical per se, she's running with this, 
but she's noticing things aren't lining up. Specifically, that this does not explain Julian. In the Scions, this role is filled by basically whoever's got cause to raise an eyebrow at this for whatever reason. Most often it's Yashtola or Rianje, and funnily enough, Nashu's ditzy butt ends up coming from the same direction. And in the community, it sort of reflects us. People like me and other lore dorks. Yes, we accept the premise we're being given, but we've got some questions. We're trying to see how this new information applies to everything before. You saw it with Dynamis, and you saw it with 6.X's Void stuff. And finally, Delian, the conspiracy theorist, he doesn't actually care. Immediately afterwards, he instead turns to the projector. In later scenes, he's damn near the straight man of it all. And that almost doesn't make sense for his character. Why does he suddenly not care about this? But then, you have to remember, he's a conspiracy theorist. If they actually cared about the mysteries that had evidence and mattered to their lives, they wouldn't be going on about aliens and underground government facilities. Now, conspiracy theorist isn't really a role in the Scions, but Delian kind of ends up taking Astinian's role from an entirely different direction. Just cut through all the high concept nonsense and focus on the real subject. Although with Delian, real might be in air quotes. And in the player base? Look, I admit that this one is a reach and they probably didn't intend it, but also I think this one is fun so I'm just gonna keep saying it. The Delians of the player base are the ones that absolutely ignore everything except for their pet theory. In Dawn Trail speculation, they're the guys absolutely convinced Solution 9 is some sort of alien conspiracy, and that Arcadion is connected to the Asians. And as far as you can tell, they just haven't really noticed anything else in the pre-release. Or in a more classical example, Delian's the kind of guy who ignores the entire story to instead keep banging on about some 1.0 loose end like Silver Tear Lake. If the root of comedy is in twisting and subverting the familiar, I don't think it's surprising that this part is the funny one to me. It's a joke playing with the part of the game I'm most familiar with. And there's ways I could have punched it up. Have the background music be the Hildebrand theme with the same instrumentation as the music they actually did use, something like that. But I do think it's pretty good the way it is. But like I said, it does kind of slip under the radar. What is there about this joke that even tells me it's a joke? Well. I think the final nail for that is the fact the joke's not done yet. The puppet show does come in the back end of the Endwalker Hildebrand story, but it's not the end end. There's still one patch left. The patch that gave us the Asura fight, the reveal of the villain's plan, and Poopoo's friend named... Poopoo's friend apparently. And first of all, a couple quick highlights of unrelated things to give this patch its due. I don't think Asura makes a lot of sense here, she's a completely serious trial in the middle of a big joke storyline. None of Hildebrand's other trials are like that, but it is a decent fight. And as to the villain, yeah, I do get that it's probably a joke about gold farming bots, but I think if that's true, they should have sold it a little harder. And Poopoo's friend having a whole nihilistic villainous monologue while looking like that is funny, but it was funnier when the Lopper at Tribe Quest did it first. He should have been the trial though, that would have played well. Afterwards, the Poopoos get a nice resolution, and Branda Hill gets an emotional sacrifice that we learn leaves him alive afterwards, which is pretty good. It might mean that this one arc Hildebrand character that deserves better than being in Hildebrand actually gets to do something else afterwards. Oh, and also Godbert did some research and found out that thanks to a quirk of succession, he and Hildebrand were never related to the alien anyway, so, you know, false alarm. And that's it, that's the part that makes me feel like this is all a knowing joke about the writing. The final kicker on a big joke of a lore dump, the non-retcon. The thing where they pull a reveal that doesn't actually take away the original lore or reveal, but does take away the part that people actually cared about. Like how we learn that Dynamis is energy that responds to emotions and helps us transcend our limits, but that it isn't actually responsible for limit breaks at all. Or that the Twelve aren't primals. They just happen to be basically primals. Honestly, credit to 14's writing that it doesn't do this nearly as much as I thought in lore, but it does do it a hell of a lot in story. Oh no, Nanamo got assassinated! Ah, oh, she's fine. Yishtol is dead! Ah, oh, she's fine. The Crystal Braves have you framed for murder and unable to enter the main cities! Oh, they won't actually stop you. Yishtol is blind! Oh, she can handle just fine. You've been pulled away from the world you know into the first! Oh, you can access all the zones again just fine. Yishtol is dead again! Ah, oh, she's fine again. 
Well, again, the game's hardly as bad about this as some other media, and I think there's a lot of moments that aren't this, that people call this. You do constantly see this reset to zero that tries not to look like that. And in a section of the story that's making a whole thing about cracking jokes about lore and the game's world building, that's a perfect final beat to bring. The non-retcon, treated like the anti-climax it always is to us, and brought on by the sort of bare minimum fact-checking that we'd expect to defuse this. Yeah, we're back to zero, but at least it was funny. So there we have it. We dissected my favourite Hildebrand joke, so it's no longer funny. I want to do some of these lighter videos while we're revving up for Dawn Trail. Let me take it a bit easier for now so I can hit the ground running when that launches. And there's a couple other story moments that I can already think of that'd be good fits for this sort of exploration. If you like this, please do YouTube things to help me out. I hope to see you all again real soon, and remember, just like Dale Gribble, Delian is the greatest trans ally on Atheris. Just don't ask him why. Please don't ask him why.